My name is Nasra and I am Director Leadership and Director IBIS. To begin with, first of all, I would like to acknowledge that we are doing our work on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Muskema, Skirmish, and Slavatoth nations. We thank them for having cared for this land and look forward to working with them in partnership as we continue to build this great, great land together. This acknowledgement is a reminder of the discriminatory, racist, and colonial practices that we have had a lasting legacy. We should learn more about the land we live on or we grew on. And this acknowledgement is a personal commitment to and appreciation for the land on which we have settled. So before I introduce our speaker, uh, dear participants, could you please write in the chat box the name of city you are joining from? And for today's brown bag session, our speaker is Dr. Yannette Valdez. She is a researcher, an educator, a mom, and a diversity leader. Her desire and goal was to be part of the work that cure people from sicknesses and to save lives. And to complete that goal, she moved from her hometown in Peru to Vancouver. She had her PhD and multiple postdocs at UBC. And indeed, she's a diversity champion and works with women in several STEM initiatives. Please welcome Dr. Yane Valdez. Thank you so much, Nesida. And thank you, everybody, for attending today. I especially, uh, Christina, for this kind invitation. And uh, before uh, sharing uh, my screen, I would like to acknowledge that I'm calling in from the ancestral and unceded territory of the Salish people. So I think I will share my screen now. Do you want to see myself here? Yes, you can see. <laughs> so today I want to talk to you about my experiences and some fascinating data about diversity in STEM. I hope by the end of the talk, you understand the necessity to increase diversity and the steps necessary to increase visibilities in Canada, particularly in STEM. I would like to ask you a favor, a challenge, a small challenge. I would like you to remember one single fact or a stat about diversity in STEM or the lack of diversity and at least share it with one more person. A while ago, I happened that I watched a fantastic documentary called Picture a Scientist. This had a profound impact on me and I learned a lot from this documentary and I highly recommend it. But what struck me from this is when people are asked to picture a scientist, the majority of people picture a man. And when the participants are made aware that they are biased, they tend to picture a white woman. And why is that? A lot starts when we are young. Data shows that twice as many males are portrayed in the media regarding females. So when we are young and kids, our brains are developing, we learn to associate men with STEM. My daughter, for example, she can't remember any women in TV. 10 years later, my boy, my son, can remember women in, in TV as well. So we are learning to associate early men with science. 
after watching this documentary, I start thinking, so how do people actually see me as a scientist? After all, I don't full fit the stereotype of a scientist. I'm a visible minority woman. I'm a woman of color. I'm an immigrant. English is not my first language. And I probably the first graduated in my family. So no, it does look strange. All these things made me wonder how was my life in the past 30 years of my career. So from these 20 to 30 years, 25 years were in Canada. So I started studying biology because I wanted to be a paleontologist. Eventually, I moved to another city to continue my undergrad research. It just happens that at that point, there was the worst cholera epidemics in Peru. So I saw many people dying, particularly kids. And it was devastating. So that changed my way of thinking and I decided to continue in infectious diseases. Then I pursued a master's in biochemistry and molecular biology in Lima and study the bacteria Helicobacter pylori that causes gastritis, ulcers, and cancer. Eventually, I moved to Canada not knowing that I was pregnant. So you can just imagine the life of a new immigrant, barely speaking English, in a new country and for with the snow. So yeah, it was a different, different life for me. Happily, my survival instincts and my motherhood kicking and I drop everything to become a hundred percent mom. So I had the opportunity to enter academia thanks to a fantastic woman named Sarah Townsend. She not only showed me and taught me immunology, but also humanity. Eventually, because I always wanted to be a doctor, I pursued a PhD in microbiology and immunology. This was an important and difficult time in my life. I was 110% focused and become a, role, a good role model for my daughter while being a student and single mom. Later, with a new life, with a new partner, with two kids, and without the flexibility to move away from Vancouver, I had a couple of postdocs before taking a position as a scientist at the stem cell technologies. I worked there for four years and returned to academia, but this time as manager of the research office at the Faculty of Medicine. So now what I'm doing, I'm doing exactly what I want, teaching immunology and working in women issues. So back then, in these 25 years, I purposely block any EDI aspects in my life because I wanted to focus in my career, my family, and my health. However, now I can go back and I can see all the hurdles and barriers that I had to face in every aspect of my life. Now, I can see good clarity. Now I'm determined to help and to break these barriers so other women will, will they don't have to go through the same steps. I 
I couldn't help but include this slide because the playbook for science is written by men for their own success and usually at expenses of women. So the playbook for science is for, written by men for men. And this actually allows what we call the culturing science. The culturing science, you know what I'm talking about. So we have to talk about the culturing science because this whole system of one mentor having a lot of influence in the life of a junior scientist needs to be reinvented. If something happens to a person and this person has to talk, could risk their career. Moreover, many women experience that when they start increasing and going and competing at the level of men. So that's when the men start shutting them down. So all this culture, unfortunately, allows for harassment in science. Harassment in academia is more common than we would like to. And it doesn't help that this harassment is not over, but it's subtle. And this is why this metaphor of the iceberg works so well, because actually a lot is hidden. When I feel uncomfortable in, in science, it's not because one aggression, but it's a series of mini aggressions that I experience. When I saw this list, I honestly was surprised of how many of those I actually experienced in my life. I was clicking almost every single box in the list. However, for me, for my personality or for the way how I am, competition and toxic environments are the ones that actually hit me but I saw many women in my life that went through so much. So no wonder why women in science didn't progress much over the years. But what is that situation? Let's go back historically. So here's the data in which the percentage of women faculty in School of Science at MIT from 1985 and 19 to 1994, when I saw this data, I actually was surprised that it didn't change at all. And first I was, I was thinking that it's empty. And then I looked, it's actually under 10% for 10 years. Interestingly, however, you can see that uh, in, 2000, in 1994, only 8% of women are faculty even though we were in, they were increasing the number of recruits. So why? This is a problem. What's happening? Although I guess we should be happy that in the past 100 years had increased from 0.6 to 29%. So it is true, it's increasing, it's increasing. Like in 2016, we have 26% of women. However, representation is not changing much. As you can see here, only 2.2% were awarded PhD, uh, PhD to black women in 2016 in the US. This is scandalous. And in 2018, it is true, there is 50% of women awarded bachelors, but the more we advance in the career, the least represented we are with only 29% employed. So this raises a question of 
why are we not retaining these women in the science? That was in the States. And then I wanted to find out what is happening in Canada. Is it the same situation or not? So I, was start look I started looking for data and I came across with a, a series of articles by the Academic Women Association of the University of Alberta. And they are led by Dr. Malinda Smith. They had published many articles in the past few years. So each year they have a, a different topic. In 2018, for instance, they talk about indigenous peoples and 2019 and 20, they talk about leadership, about presidencies of universities. So in the following slides, I will be showing some of this data. Here in 2018, we have a good number, 60% of bachelor's degrees were women. But again, the more we advance in our careers, the least represented we are. We see at level of presidency, only 26% are women. And if we wanna see globally, about visible minority representation, we can see that only 22% are visible minority, minority groups with mostly 78% uh, white people. Similarly, if we see the wage gap that we always talk about, this is true. White people tend to earn more than any other groups. And this is even more dramatic if, if you are a woman. So if I had continuing academia by 2018, I will be at the really at the bottom of the pay scale. It's interesting, isn't it? Uh, in the past years, the government of Canada had launched different initiatives uh, to create more funding, like the Canada Excellence Research, Canada 100. And as you can see here, still, we still will say it, CRCs are white men dominant. And even though C-150s are increasing in number of percentage of women, visible minority women are still very less. Uh, and other groups and other initiatives like tier one and tier two is still mainly white men dominant. So what happens at the level of leadership and, and the level of university presidents? We can see that yes, again, white men are the majority. And this is really worrying because after three years of EDI, in, three decades, sorry, of EDI initiatives in Canada, leadership in Canada is still white and male dominant. And this is really important because they are the decision makers. So we need to do something. Oh, here is, the granulated data, and as you can see here, we are, I guess, I consider myself UBC. Yes, we don't have, we never had a minority or visible minority women. Apparently there was one woman in the University of Waterloo. I went back to the data actually and looked and I couldn't find that woman. In fact, I emailed Dr. Smith to ask who this person is because it would be nice to know her. So we are in a problem. We have a problem here. Oh, this is a last uh, 2020 uh, article by uh, Dr. Jennifer Fuji Johnson from Simon Fraser, in which she concludes that yes, it's important and these initiatives are good because are coming uh, 
we're including more women in different leadership positions. However, the beneficiaries of this inclusion are mostly white women and visible minority women maintain the same. They are the same. So I think visible minority women shouldn't have to take the burden or for getting Canada more equitable. I am appealing to the majority group, to white men, to use their status, their power to help us to make Canada more diverse and more equitable for everybody. Here in this slide, uh, this metaphor of the leaky pipeline has been shown, has been used widely to illustrate that diversity in STEM is broken at every stage of the career progression from en engagement to sustaining. And they were, we're asking to how to patch this leaky pipeline. So I would like you to think about this and I will return uh, later to this point. Because I wanna remind you again, we talk about diversity, diversity instead, but why diversity matters? Why is it important? So we all know, and, and I'll remind you again, that diverse, socially diverse groups are better at solving problems, are coming with new ideas. They have different perspectives. Therefore, it drives excellence, creativity, and innovation. It's important also because they can reduce the health disparities in Canada. So as the world is going, we know that the demographics are changing everywhere. And in Canada, our demographics, demographics are changing because we're receiving more immigrants. So the more they prepare we are to receive these uh, immigrants, we will maintain our status of global eminence. So diversity is important. And as a scientist, we always want data. So yes, uh, this is uh, a slide that I borrowed from the NIH in which they actually analyzed many papers and they saw that papers written with diverse groups receive not only more citations, but they are published in journals with higher impact factors. So diversity improves the quality of science. We talk about diversity. We know that diversity is good. So what is happening? Why are we not improving? I feel that a lot starts with implicit bias. What are implicit bias? These are these attitudes, stereotypes that affect our understanding, actions, and decisions in an unconscious manner. So they are not intentional, but they can still impact how we judge others based on factors like race, ability, gender, culture, and language. And this is quite scary. And in fact, everybody is susceptible to implicit bias. So you don't have to be a racist with a capital R to harbor implicit biases. And implicit biases are fascinating because they are automatic, instant. So an act in a way that you and your principles and beliefs probably are not there. So this is frightening. So we have to address implicit bias head on. And that will be the first, the very first step in recognizing that there is a problem and you start mitigating all the problems that we have. I actually ask you if you have time to run a test and of implicit bias. So just to see how you how you are in that. 
Here, this is a classical example in STEM. And what happened is that the authors wanted to ask if there is a implicit bias in, in the sciences. So what they did, they created uh, an imaginary student and they had a hundred of them, 50, they were identical, 50 of them were named as John and the other 50 were as a Jennifer. And they were sent to 100 uh, university professors across the, the states. And they were asked to rank the student in capability and if they will hire them, if they recommend uh, salary, et cetera, et cetera. And the results are shocking. The results show that both male and female professors tend to hire or well, recommend a male over a female in competency, higher ability. They would like to be mentors for them and in starting salary. And this is, this demonstrate that actually we have bias in STEM. And this is shocking, it is difficult for a woman. Imagine the repercussions for a woman that wants to go into STEM careers and the whole, and the whole community of science. So we need interventions addressing faculty gender bias to increase more participation of women in sciences. So back again to the uh, leaky pipeline. And I want you to now start thinking all together in this. How do we patch this leaky pipeline? Some people suggest that we should include more female mentors. And, and this is based in an in a experiment that was done in which uh, female engineers were matched with uh, female mentors and that retained a lot of the, the women engineers. Some people suggest that we should be increasing more uptake of women in the sciences. However, these people, and I favor that, that turning up the flow won't fix the pipeline because we have to recognize that we have barriers at every stage of the career progression in the life of the science and the pipeline. So it is actually uh, important to start going and looking at each aspect to mitigate these problems. But I think many people agree as Kathleen Grogan published it, that the entire STEM community should be addressing this problem, that all together as a community, as a village, we need to work together towards more inclusivity in the sciences. Some people are actually working actively to give recommendations of how to do this. Uh, here, I'd say some recommendations from uh, Akiko Iwasaki. She's working actively again to as an advocate. She thinks that we can knock the barriers to allow more women in science by providing simple things like affordable, accessible childcare, conduct couple of recruitments, educate all for implicit bias, diversity recruitment committees, and change the understandings and the metrics of success. And changing the mindset and the tactics. So highlighting women contributions in our fields, a place, a value of mentorship. I would like to have had a mentor that looks just like me, but I didn't. Acknowledge and tackle biases, create policies and institutional solutions 
increase women and minority groups in leadership positions recognize the need of collective effort. So include men to help women. So he for she. Amplify the voices of women. Identify and hire qualified women and minorities and obviously increase women in leadership roles. So this, we should be working institutionally at that level. However, I would like to ask you to take individual steps so you can help by being an ally, by sharing your experience, getting involved, requesting training, amplify again the voices of women, educate yourself, create new mechanisms, mentor young scientists, change your mindset, the processes, and finally lead by example. So walk your talk. I wanna close uh, my talk by asking you two favors. One, to the women uh, here, to extend your hand to each other because we are much stronger when we work together. And to everyone, to put a little bit of help, women, men, anybody, all working as a village, as a community to change and be a more diverse, inclusive, and equitable Canada. So with that, so because it's because we can't be losing more young, talented scientists due to exclusion and harassment. So I want you, I think all we should work together. With that, I want to say thank you to the pillars in, in my scientific career, Dr. Bob Gilman and the Gilman family, Dr. Sarah Townsend, Dr. Brett Finley and the Finlights, the Finley community. Thank you to all the institutions that hosted me, my university in Cusco, my university in Peru, Hopkins, WashU, UBC, to the places I work on, stem cell technologies and the faculty of medicine, and to the groups of women in, I guess, working for women that believe in me, international uh, women in science, and obviously the Swiss. So thank you so much. Thanks to my family that uh, it's always with me in difficult times and in nice times, and to you amazing people. So I am, Happy to take any questions now. I have a question. Okay. Um, what university did she go to first? Which universities? Mm -hmm. Oh, I went to like four universities. I had a bachelor's in in science from the University of uh, Cusco, that my, my hometown. And then I had a, uh, like a master's degree from the University of Cayetano Heredia. Then I had a PhD from the University of, of, University of uh, UBC. Thank you. Okay, so thank you, Yanni, for that great presentation and sharing great, interesting, and yet shocking statistics on diversity and biases. And these are part of our workplaces in academia. So before we move to the question and answer session, uh, we want to take a screenshot of the event. So can I request all of the participants to turn your video on? So Christine will take a screenshot. Okay, um, in one second, is everybody in? 
one. Okay, I'm gonna um, thirty more, twenty more seconds, just waiting to, for others to come in. All right. Uh, okay. All right. Smile. And one more, please. We have others here. Okay. Okay. We're going to put this on social media, so keep track, please. Uh, go ahead, Anasira. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. So. No, uh, participants, you are all, all of you are welcome to ask questions. You can ask questions on how her experiences can help you succeed in your STEM career. And anybody can jump in and ask a question. Okay, I have a question here. It says, I'm really interested in vaccinology. However, in a country with little prospect in this regard, I would like to learn and attend college in this specialty. What prospects do you have for this career? I guess vaccinology now, it's a really hot topic. And uh, you could, Depends where you are. You could either study online, but I think in terms of vaccines, and I, I work in vaccines myself, and it takes a long time to work. So I, if you have the opportunity to go back to school and like develop the vaccines, because it's a lot of experiment, experiments, that would be great. But I think if you are interested, just go for it. And, and there are like lots of people in, in my case that we can help and support and be mentors. If, if you wanna go to one or another um, another place, I don't know where you are. I don't know who is, yeah, the person that was uh, asking, but yes, uh, uh, there are places in Canada that you can do that. So there is a question. At what point, Yanni, do you think stopping the the leaky holes is makes more sense? Do we have more hope with the younger generation? Or do we need to really focus on the upper echelons right now? I think I will start. If you ask me, I will start at every single point. There is no one leaky. Leaky, the pipeline is leaky everywhere. So we could have like first training to understand because many people really don't understand the problem. So they think it's working, but it's not. So then we could work and train at in leadership, professorship, everywhere. I mean, if we don't have good leaders, there is no point because it's still gonna be the status quo. So then we have to go from the beginning. And I mean, data showing that there's more people, there are more women interested in science. So yes, we can still attract them, but they have to see more role models to go and making it because a lot of people, they enter, but if you see the many careers of women are like, shatter. So then, yes, we have to work at every level. I don't think there is one, uh, one specific area. I think we, we have to work focusing in entrance and getting more people, but fixing the problems at each stage. Okay, so there is another question. What challenges you faced in making a transition from academia to industry? Like what types of skills, resources, and networking platforms were key to your successful transition? Uh, this is a difficult question. I think I would say that for me it was my my soft skills. I I easily make connections with people, so I use a lot of my connections not only in the uh, in the company to still work at, with academics. So while I was in the company, I was still keep up 
of what in my in academic and working together. Networking, I it's only this year, actually last year, that I started using platforms. Before I never had any platform to use. In fact, my daughter created my LinkedIn and she runs my LinkedIn. And I'm doing Twitter just this year as well. So before I didn't do anything. And um, but also it's your interactions. I think a lot for me was my interactions. Uh, in, in fact, I never applied for my position in at the stem cell. I was invited to join. And this is because you, you are connected with a lot of people and you talk and you make your, you brand yourself. Uh, so then for me that I think it was, uh, that was good. So then they call you, they recognize you. I think interactions, connections are important. Yes. Yeah. yeah, sure, personal connections. You never know when they land you into a chair. Yeah. So, yeah, so the next question is, what made you interested to get into the field of immunology? I think, yeah, first, uh, I would say that when I was studying in Peru, I never took the class of immunology. But uh, in uh, one day, I come across with a, a scientific American and I read an article. I think the whole issue was about immunology. And then I read about um, the biology of the B cells and T cells, an article by Max Cooper. And that was intriguing. That was very interesting. So when I came to Canada and there was this position as a immunology with the possibility of training. So I just took it and I had, and I guess I had I was lucky enough to have one fantastic, fantastic mentor. So Sarah Townsend, she trained with uh, Jim Allison, who was a Nobel Prize. So then I got all that training from her. So, and once I studied immunology, I just couldn't, I couldn't leave it. It's fascinating. It's fascinating how you survive and your body actually defends you in your entire life through pat with pathogens, all takes care of you. So I guess that's for me important. So how you are going through your life knowing that you have something in you that's taking care of you. And yeah, and the molecular mechanisms are just fascinating. Yeah, I was, uh, yeah, I was connecting your desire to cure sicknesses. Yes. To your field of immunology. Yeah. Okay, so the next question is, what were, what were some barriers you experienced trying to pursue a STEM field? Hmm. Many, I guess, many. I mean, uh, coming to Canada, I mean, you have to learn a new language, a new culture, have to face many problems. Immunology itself is another language. So, yeah, it was difficult. Uh, being a single mom was one of the most difficult things for me because you are vulnerable and many people want to take advantage with you because they think you are alone. And that was hard because knowing that other women can even like somehow take advantage of you is even more difficult. So, but uh, I guess uh, having to deal with family and career is very complicated. It's really difficult. So, yeah, it's it's not easy. That was probably my most difficult challenge. Okay, so there are so many questions. So, mm -hmm. so what is a piece of advice you would give a girl who is wanting to pursue a field in STEM? Just go for it. Just go for it. <laughs> go for it. Just if you're interested, it's fascinating. I mean, if you have the curiosity, motivation, it's, nothing should stop you. Now, there are many of us now that we are helping. We want to help the new generation. So you can always find more mentors. Okay, so what do you love most about the field of immunology? Yeah, I guess, again, it's the fact that you can actually use your immune system to cure diseases, you know? Like, for instance, the whole vaccinology thing, it's just 
training your immune system to defend you against uh, a pathogen. So you can use, uh, so it's fascinating to see how cells in your body communicate to each other and try to defend you, how they see, how they govern your entire body. So from the skin, from like everywhere in your body, you have your immune system, your immune system is everywhere. So it's trying to help you. It's protecting you. I think that's why it's fascinating because you, it's like somebody inside helping you all the time. So you can rely on it. Yes, sure. So next is how to promote diversity in STEM in areas with a low socioeconomic status of college students. Uh, that's, that's difficult. I think that not impossible. So I think Many of us, and I was just actually watching the University of um, Calgary giving uh, awards to people that are trying to do that exactly. There are groups of indigenous people that they are trying to like increase the uptake of those students. So I would say myself, I, I didn't come from a family, from a rich family. I just had the interest and the motivation. And I think it depends where you are, but also it would be much, it would have been much more easier for me if I had mentors, if I had people and encouragement that I had somebody to hold my hand and take me. And so I think in, in places like that, it would be nice to, to go, I think, a participation of many of us to go and say, you want to do that, so let's do it together. We can help you. So I think it's more a partnership because you don't want to be entering in the circle that things are impossible. We want to see, we want to see the light. So yes, uh, I think outreach will be important. Uh, I think uh, uh, open, openness, like, so if there is a group of people that are marginalized, they should open and ask for resources and other groups also look at this. So partnerships, I think it would be. Okay, so thank you. So what was the toughest career decision you made? And do you think it would be easier if you had to make it in present day again? The first, the first what? Uh, what was the toughest career decision you made? Yeah, I think the most difficult for me is having never applying for a faculty position. I never applied for a faculty position. And for many, many reasons. I think most of it was because I wanted, I didn't want to fail again. I, because I, happens that my husband is also in academics and he had a tenure position here at uh, UBC. So I couldn't live somewhere else. I had a family, I didn't, I, I wanted to focus on my family. I didn't want my family to collapse. And, um, but now also, I think I, I was insecure because I, I didn't have a good, postdoctoral uh, um, so my postdoc was not as productive as uh, my PhD so I thought I didn't have enough papers and so for all these reasons I didn't even try it but now I will yeah I think now I have the confidence and I could yeah I think so if I have to give advice, please go for it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so do we have uh, like many postdoc opportunities so you can choose from or there are not so many? Uh, depends, oh, like, yes, internationally. And in fact, in academia, it's advisable to go somewhere else. So in, for me, I just had to choose postdocs that are in Vancouver because I couldn't move. But 
in other places, you could travel everywhere. And I think this is the time that you have the most flexibility. There are many, many opportunities to travel and choose which uh, mentor or type of science you would like to do. So yes, definitely there are many opportunities. Okay, so there is another important question regarding immigrants. Uh So can you give any tips for immigrants with science research background that are new to Vancouver? Yeah, it's this is uh, important because um, when I came, I didn't know anybody. I came uh, on December 24, and it was a snowy, snowy day. So I, in that, in those years, I didn't even leave. I was so sick. I was pregnant. I was so sick. So I didn't know anybody. But now I can see like there are many groups. Like you guys have a chapter of immigrant. Uh, women, the IWS, and there are many groups that could actually uh, help you navigate all this, the problem. I mean, simple stuff, you know, why do you do this? How do you do that? That I had to learn. So definitely I will, uh, if you are coming first is connect with people and look and seek for help and uh, join groups and not only will help you in terms of relationships, but then simple things will uh, make your life easier. Yes. Okay, so next question is, which part of your career did you enjoy the most in your STEM journey? And was that phase more or less challenging, making it interesting and exciting? I think mm, during my master's was fantastic because I was a sing I mean I was single I was early in my early 20s I moved to another city it's the first time I was away from my family and I was in a fantastic group mostly women somehow and then I'm from all over Peru and it's a university of medicine only and our advisor was from Hopkins and so we have a lot of interaction we work we work a lot. It was it was great, and also we had the flexibility to do our own thing. And then um, my PhD was the same actually. I had so at this point I was a mature student, so I was ten years older than the rest. So I could just do my stuff, even though it was a. Um, um, difficult because I had to take care of a child and I had to work sometimes a little bit more to get more money. But I was doing scientifically, I was free to work in whatever I wanted. So that was the Finley Lab. In the Finley Lab, you choose your topic and you just develop it. So that was that was good. So then actually I developed more as a scientist there. So I enjoy it. And I mean, and the atmosphere with the people in the lab was just crazy. It was fantastic people from all over the world and it's a, a great family. So again, for me, for, for my, I guess, uh, personality, having a good environment, it's important because I thrive. If I have a toxic environment, I just die. Definitely. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, we have shared Yanni's LinkedIn and Yanni's Twitter on the, in the ch- chat box. Please connect with her and you can like ask more questions. So the next question is from Monica and she's curious to ask that what would be the number one advice to girls, like teens, minorities, staying at a correctional facility in the States to pursue a career in STEM? So she's having a talk with them through the Skype a scientist initiative. So she's asking this question. I guess it will be motivating, like motivating the girls, like just to let them know that they can do it. They are able to find out things uh, that other people don't. Like that is the flexibility that we have in science. You know, science allows you to understand things that other people don't even know so you create knowledge so if they have if they feel empowered to learn things that they nobody knows and they can pursue they can investigate I think they will be motivated but also tell them that there are people that are there to help them because it could be frightening 
to think if you start thinking and you have these mentors that are mostly men and they don't look like them so then they feel like they don't belong but so showing them that there are people from different parts of the world that are curious about things so yes you can do it so give them that you can do it thank you Yana. so karen asked about anna trudella so have you met with her she's an amazing peruvian woman who immigrated to vancouver and worked in diversity no, 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 I don't actually. Watch, that's okay. interesting. See, I'm looking forward to meet her. Yeah, Anna Trudella. So, Karen, you can connect with uh, Yanni and talk about her. Um, and yeah, there are a few announcements about our next events you can see in the chat. And did I miss any question? Um, can I ask a question? Yes, please. Okay. Because there are so um, many and I, maybe I am missing a few. Sure. Uh, thank you so much. This was super relatable. And um, thank you for being very candid. Those are not things that we hear a lot. And uh, I think it makes um, us, and I feel like I share lots of personality traits with the women here, uh, that um, it makes us feel really vulnerable when everyone around us is behaving like everything is normal and everything is great and you just need to work very hard. And it's like, what are you talking about? I am working hard. Like, what, anyway, so, so thank you for being candid with that. Um, so my question is a little bit related. It's how do you uh, bring up those topics or do any efforts in your immediate lab uh, without you being labeled as that person, right? Like people just look at you like you're coming from out of space when you talk about, you know, the need for diversity, when you talk about maybe um, like I, I did this um, class, it's a genetics class. And um, uh, my topic was um, um, like familial relations in the data, like bias and stuff. It's very technical, but in the first few slides, I talked about um, racism in genetics and, and the past and all of that. And I, 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 I spent so much time um, uh, uh, getting those resources and putting them in one slide. And I said, you know, screenshot this and go read this stuff. And then it was, it was basically like I told them, you know, I'm gonna kill you now. Everyone was like dead silent. No one made any remark. Even my PI didn't even say, oh, he was just like, yeah, some good reminders there at the end, like nothing. So I felt very deflated after that. And this is just one example that, that is recent, but this happens a lot. Um, it feels like everyone is more comfortable just sweeping these things under the rug. So how would you advise we deal with that situation? I, well, the thing is, I know. I, I need to <laughs> uncomfortable situations, and they will be. And at this point in my life, I should, I don't care. You know, you they have to, they just have to listen. I mean, I mean, I'm, I think you have to think about the goal. If the goal is educating, you just have to make sure they might not like it. Seriously, they don't like it, but it's uncomfortable, but you just, you at least make the, the, yes, you at least give this step. But then in my personality again is like, yeah, I try, I try and we well, let's talk about, it. I think I, um, I have to kind of learn over the years, 25 years here and even with my family. So we keep talking, keep talking. So I'm not as uh, embarrassed anymore. So I just talk directly with people and, Tell. I mean, at the beginning, I was very, very cautious, but but now I don't. We have to. I mean, the good thing is that it's happening everywhere now. So yeah. it's not just one person. It's happening in the world. Last year and this year, it's like more, more awareness. And so the more we talk, we it's the better for us. So no, it's. Yeah. So, so I, I guess the follow up to that is that we are calling ourselves immigrants like I was here for 20 years as well and yeah. I, I, I mean I still I get very involved in the, you know minority women or immigrants or whatever it's like um, 
It, it's hard because we are forced to categorize ourselves into group in order to advocate for ourselves and for the, the people who are just coming and all of that. But also, uh, I don't think it's very, very accepted. I feel that um, I had many people uh, tell me that uh, you just need to sort of merge with everyone. And um, in Canada, there is an attitude of uh, political correctness, uh, which is, I think, very misguided because um, it's not because we are polite that we do we shouldn't talk about issues and we, we are on a, a country which was built on genocide and and I think we should be talking about that but because there is power imbalance between so I'm not a PI I'm postdoc right so there is power imbalance between people in general situations and, and seniors and you have to be careful what you're doing otherwise you're not gonna get hired, you're not gonna get promoted, you're not gonna get recommended, you're not, you're not, you're not, you're not. So I, totally I don't think there's an answer for that. I'm just putting this in the universe. Well, I, think, I think it's important though, because I guess if you see from the side of the privilege, they don't, they don't have to go through that problem. They don't know how much, for instance, I was making a justice to myself I have to work twice as much to go to the same level. So I have to try to speak another language, to come up for, to another culture, to achieve what a person was here. So they don't see that part. So they treat you because you have the same, uh, we'll say degree, you should be the same, but they don't see, again, it's a, another metaphor of the iceberg. They just see the top, but they don't see the, behind it, but it's important for us to advocate for ourselves and tell them, listen, I have to be speaking in another language. I have to be going through this for you to understand me. And, but some, some people is because they're not even aware of that. So we, we, I mean, and it's unfair that we have to be fighting for minorities <laughs> and that's why I'm asking, I'm appealing the other people because on top of our jobs, we have to be appealing for that. So it's, we are working two or three times to just have an equitable environment and it's not fair. So the more we talk, the more we have more advocates and I'm asking mostly the privileged people, men, that they should be doing this. They should be helping us. But obviously, it doesn't impact them. doesn't impact them. So then that's what we have to be working on together, together, together. So yes, I am all the time going and asking and asking and asking, please, this is how I go. And it takes, takes courage for you to go and speak. I didn't speak for 20 something, for 22 years until just last year I started talking. I didn't. So in fact, I blocked that. So now last year I was like, okay, why should I? So the COVID allows me to, okay, I'll think and I'll talk. Okay, so uh, Martinza, does, do you have a question? Yes, thank you. So first of all, Dana, thank you so much for a excellent talk and for sharing uh, all your experiences. Um, I feel I, I relate very well with what you said and what you went through. Uh, I, I also immigrated from Colombia uh, 21 years ago to Canada. Uh, so uh, I, I can understand very well what you said and what you didn't say, but we understood as well. Uh, and I just wanted to mention that one of the things that um, I think it's important to keep in mind is that we need uh, a leadership. A, we need people that are, are underrepresented minorities in the leadership positions because that's one of the ways I think is, it will be much easier to uh, address the problem that Lubna was saying, you know, when when you're talking like in the desert, it's, it's very hard. We have to do it and making people uncomfortable is is a big part of the job. It's the only way to start thing, uh, getting into people's minds and changing the culture. But also if we have a leader that is already a minority, it makes things much easier. And we just recently saw it with Kamala Harris becoming the first vice president, yeah. female vice president, South, uh, um, 
South Asian, African American. It's all the first that she's uh, she's doing. And when she says something, it's different. First of all, because she went through this, so we all know that she is talking about her own experiences and she can relate to what we we had to go through and we still have to. But also, uh, um, when someone with authority uh, says something is very different than when we say, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. So I think we definitely get to uh, get more leaders uh, when we, uh, with Janet, show us all those graphs in which we can see presidents, deans, and it's going so solo. And then if it's a woman, it's a white woman. So that also doesn't help us at all. So we definitely need to work towards that goal. Yeah, definitely. Totally agree. Totally agree. Thanks, Maritza. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Yanni, someone asked that, uh, how can we access the picture, a scientist movie? So actually they have a website and, uh, and many institutions are uh, broadcasting because I think it's not just on, on TV or Netflix. So it's, uh, it's actually very, very profound. And many institutions now, uh, in, in fact, for the people that want to see in, in Spanish, there will be another showing, uh, I think next week, I, I'm going to show it in, in, I mean, with subtitles in Spanish. So I am, I'm going to send that by Twitter. But yes, go to the website and then some institutions are showing. I actually watch five times and every time I cry. <laughs> so it's, um, it's, it's remarkable. And I think, uh, yeah. So I think next, mm, next week also University of Calgary will be showing. So different universities are doing it. As an institution, you guys could do it as well. So then you can just go ask them and they give you, and there are like, um, uh, material to study after as well. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, I happened to watch the very first showing and where some and or the protagonists, the scientists that were in the movie were there talking. So we could ask them questions. That was in September. Mm -hmm. That was great. That was great. And, uh, but yes, um, uh, you have to go to the website or just see and subscribe in any institutions that are showing. Okay. Okay, thank you. And somebody inquired that, are you going to share your slides with us? Sure, I, I can, I can do that. Okay, so you can send to Christine and then she can share with the participants. Fantastic, okay, definitely, that's, yeah. And with that, a big thanks to all participants for attending this workshop. So we went a bit over time, so many people have left but, um, this time. And so rest of the participants, I invite you all to join us at the next event of this series. And this one is on how to build trust and connection online. And the speaker is Leah Koss and it's happening on February 10th. You know the time, the lunch hour. So, and finally we ask that you please fill out the event evaluation survey so we can make these events better and better. And thank you so much. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Can we do a Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you all.